My name is Katrina Walzer from Oliphant Cat and I am a knitting teacher and designer based here in Sydney in Australia. And welcome to episode 14 of my monthly podcast on the needles. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand, the Darug people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. So today is the 6th of October and I have a bunch of whips and FOs to show you, some of which have been very long running whips that are now FOs, which I'm pretty excited about. But first off, I have a coffee sponsor for the day. So I am drinking a long black, which thoroughly confused my barista because I always get cappuccinos. And if you don't know what a long black is, that's totally fine. They're called different things in different countries, and I don't know what all of those words are. So feel free to Google it if you're overseas. But my caveat sponsor today actually asked to remain anonymous. So thank you very much. You know who you are. I do really appreciate your support. And if you'd like a shout out on my podcast, then my link to the link to my Kofi account is down below. I'd really appreciate your support if you get something out of these podcasts or just enjoy them in general and basically I take everyone who shouted me a coffee in the month before and just choose a name out of a hat and they get a shout out so if you'd like a chance for that there's a link down below to uh, where you can buy me a coffee and I'd really appreciate it okay so the first section we have as always is on the needles which are all of my whips and FOs So my first FO today is what I'm wearing. This is my My May Aimer cardigan. Oh, that's a bit of a tongue twister. And I did finish it last month. So if you were here last month, you'll have seen this as an FO, but I hadn't blocked it yet. So I figured I would block it and show it to you. So here we are in all its glory. Uh, I'll stand up. It's about this long. And if you haven't seen this before, it is a knit out of yarn from Saltbush Skeins, who are unfortunately no longer dying, but I think you can still find a little bit of her yarn knocking around on the internet. If I can find any stockists, I'll link them down below. And the color was Melted Bubble Bill. It's just a regular sock yarn. Now, at the end of my chat about this jacket last month, I said I didn't think it was going to grow much when I blocked it. Unfortunately, it did a little bit. So it does feel a little roomier than I meant for it to. Uh, but the main problem with it was that after I'd worn it for a while, the neckline was big enough. Well, I realized that the neckline was big enough after I blocked it that it kept falling off my shoulders. So I fixed it using a crochet hook. So essentially what I did is that I did a little bit of crochet from the shoulder seam seam to the other shoulder seam on this side and then I also did it on this side and I did that basically at the neckline the very edge of the collar up here and that way it just cinched it all in a little bit if you don't know how to crochet along the edges of your knitting which I actually do quite a lot to just fix things that need to be like sucked in a little bit more then um there is a tutorial from Edible Thoughts Makes, who runs a really great podcast. If you haven't seen her before, you should probably go check her out too. Um, and I will put a link to that down below if you want to get some practice with your crochet skills. So yes, that's my Mayama. I've been wearing a lot. It's very cozy. It's meant to be spring here, but it's still very cold and rainy, which is a bit of a trend the last couple of years in Sydney. So I think I'm still going to get quite a bit of use out of this. My next FO is my Sizzle Pop. So if you've been here for a while, you will have seen this many times because it has been a very long running project. So I think I cast this on last October, probably. Something like that. I worked on it pretty consistently from October all the way through January or so. And then I decided to put it down because it was hurting my head a little bit too much. I wasn't as used to brioche back then as I am now. And so... Uh, it just took a lot of mental energy to knit on. And then I put it into hibernation, which is what I call it when I just put things away and decide not to think about them or work on them anymore. 
And then I picked it back up again last month and I have a bit of a spiel about how I put the how I put it back on the needles and why it was a bit easier to work on once I picked it back up again. So if you want to see that, that's also in last month's podcast episode. So the yarn is from Fortune Yarn Co, which is the variegated pinky color on her Tweety sock base. And it's called Watermelon Tool Marine. That's the colorway. And then the contrast color, which is this lovely sort of greeny gray, is from By Corolla Down Under. I don't remember what the colorway was because she doesn't really do colorways because she's a natural dyer. So she just calls the colors based off of what she used to dye the yarn. And every dye lot is very, very different. So she doesn't really have colorways per se. So yeah, it is beautiful. Uh, what do I have to tell you about it? So the red stitch marker here is where I was last time I spoke to you. So it did definitely grow quite a bit. I was very intent on finishing basically every last speck of the yarn because I didn't want any leftovers. So technically I think it should be one repeat shorter if you do follow the pattern or maybe like half a repeat shorter. But I just kept doing repeats until the yarn basically ran out. And it does mean that I ended in a bit of an awkward position because I didn't have enough yarn to do a full chart repeat. But it looks fine. I think it looks fine. Um, <laughs> but I also ended up having to do something really strange with the bind off. So if you look very closely, and hopefully it's not even that obvious. Uh, where is it? So from this corner to this edge, the bind off is in the main color or the variegated yarn. And then once you get to here, to the very end, it is the bind off is in the contrast color because I ran out of yarn <laughs> to finish the bind off. So I really, really used up every single speck of yarn that I had. And it's beautiful. Let me put this on. That's what it looks like. And one of the only upsides of the fact that it's being cold and rainy is that I can still wear my knits. So I'm looking forward to getting a lot of use out of this. Okay, <clears throat> the next FO I have is my Daphne top. And this one I'm very excited about because I have been working on this for a really long time and I'm very glad to finally have it off of my needles. So this is a pattern by Friday Knits, who is a designer down in Melbourne. It's got these gorgeous big puffy sleeves and a lot of eye cord detailing. It's got these cool cups here in the front and then some ribbing in the back to help with the fit. So this I put into hibernation probably in May or so because it was caused me a lot of headaches. Basically, I don't do so well with negative ease at the moment just because my body's changed a little bit and I'm still sort of struggling to figure out how to figure out sizing and things like that um, and what actually fits me. And with this top, it is written for negative ease and I did need quite a bit of negative ease at the top to make sure that it would all fit correctly. But then once it got to the waist and down, I didn't want it to be negative because it was just too tight around my tummy, which I don't love. So essentially what I did, um, I have talked a lot about all the modica modifications that I've done with this. So I'll pop a link up in the corner to the last podcast where I talked about the mods on the top. But basically I rewrote the pattern. <laughs> so I'm using all the stitch counts and the construction for the sleeves, but then I really changed how I knit the top. And then last podcast episode, I was up to here, I think. Wait. Was this even on last podcast episode? No, I think I put this back on the needles between the last podcast episode and now. But the last time I showed this to you all, it was up to this I cord right here and I needed to do the body. So essentially what I did is because it was just being too tight, I increased like nobody's business. So I moved the increases. Usually when you do increases for waist shaping, you do them on the side. So most patterns will have you do two increases along what's essentially the side seam. And I say seam because it was done in the round, so there isn't actually a seam. 
but yeah, so usually you do two increases here on the side and then two on the other side. But there is a way of doing increases where you move those four increases around so that you have one here in the front and one here in the front on this side, basically in the middle, and then the same thing on the back. So that's what I did because I figured that would help the shaping a little bit better, uh, especially around your stomach if you're trying to increase to get over like your tummy essentially. So if you do increases down the sides, essentially what you're doing is making a triangle. And that's good for particular body shapes and particular garments. So it's usually pretty good for me because I have a bit of an hourglass shape. So I'm small at the top, small in the waist, and then I go out quite a bit quickly uh, towards the edges. So I guess that's not an hourglass. I don't know, whatever, trapezium. <laughs> And so having increases on the sides usually works quite nicely for me because it just goes out. But if you move your increases to the front and the back, it makes more of a tube. So instead of just being a triangle, the increases spread out and they start spreading out this way. So it makes more of a cone. So I don't really know how to explain that any better, but that's essentially what's going on. <laughs> is that you're expanding not just sideways, but also front ways and back ways. So that can work better if you are trying to emphasize different parts of your bodies or in this part, hide different parts of your body because I wasn't liking how tight it was on the tummy. So if I move the increases to the front, then it pushes it out more that way as opposed to just that way. So I hope that makes a bit of sense. Uh, if you want some guidance on how to do that for yourself or how to change a pattern to use that sort of waist shaping instead of this sort of waist shaping. I will put a link to a great blog post from I think Amy Herzog down below onto how you can do that and how you can modify patterns to use a different type of shaping. So that's what I did and I had to increase a lot because this was negative ease on the waist and I wanted it to have sort of positive ease around the tummy and so it went from being tight on a smaller place to being loose on a bigger place. So I just had to like really just increase. So essentially you can see the lines, they're pretty defined. So those two lines there sitting across the front, those are the increase lines. And I did one increase along each line every second row or round. So that's increasing really quickly. Um, and I did that all the way from about an inch down from the waist to the bottom of the shirt. And then I also did the same thing in the back. The increases aren't as obvious, but I did them a little bit more slowly on the back. So I did them every four rounds on the back because I didn't need it to push out quite as quickly or quite as much going this way. So yeah, I hope some of that makes sense. Uh, the top does fit quite nicely now around the tummy. It did stretch out a bit while I blocked it, which means that the sleeves are a little bit too big now. Uh, around the shoulder so they were falling down a little bit so I'm either going to do the same thing that I did with this jacket and crochet around the edges just to like tighten them in a bit or I might also try threading some elastic into just this sort of like bit of the eye cord here I do have some skinny elastic that I used for some sewing projects so I'll give one of those two things a go, see how it goes. I'll probably start with the crochet and if that doesn't work then I'll switch to the elastic because I don't really look forward to sewing stuff into my knitting. So I'm looking forward to wearing this. I did actually get a chance to wear it a couple of days ago. It's a great top for sort of slightly cooler but sunny weather because uh, it's knit out of 8-ply. So this is Bendigo Woolen Mills Luxury 8-ply. And so it's just a great sort of transitional piece. So hopefully if I get the fixes in and it's not too cold next podcast episode, I will wear it then. I did have one other piece that I knit, but I can't show it to you because it was for a yarn company. So I sent that off to them. Um, I do want to make one of my own though. So that pattern's coming out in November. And I may just cast them on for fun and I'll show them to you then. <laughs> okay, so I do have a whip, but it has to do with what I wanted to talk about for like life stuff. So I will do that now. 
So the next section that I always have is off the needles, which is general life stuff, <laughs> sometimes knitting related and sometimes not. And this is definitely a bit of both because it has a whip involved. Okay, so my one whip that I still have on my needles right now is my Rainbow Baby Baby Blanket. This is a pattern that I'm designing. The yarn is from Woolen Works. Um, I don't have my extra ball, which was a bit silly, but it's a slub yarn. And the color is Karma Chameleon. And it's this gorgeous sort of rainbowy, speckly color. Uh, and then the contrast color that I'm holding it double with is just a plain eight ply cotton from Bendigo Woolen Mills. And so each of them by themselves, this is very plain, this is very intense. And when you hold them together, which is what I'm doing, it makes this gorgeous sort of textured, creamy, rainbowy blanket. So the reason that I wanted to talk about this during Off the Needles is that this has a bit of a story behind it. And I am about to talk about basically women's health and fertility issues. So if this is something that's triggering to you, I'm really sorry that you've gone through that. And I would suggest that you skip forward to this timestamp here, uh, or there's a timestamp to the bookmarks down below. Just skip forward to the section called Knitting Clinic. Okay, so I've talked about this a little bit on the podcast before, and I'm going to try and keep this brief because if I talk about it for too long, I'll probably get overly emotional. <laughs> so uh, I had a miscarriage back in 2016. And then uh, we were really lucky to have my daughter, who is now three and a half. And then back in February of this year, I had another miscarriage. It was something called an ectopic pregnancy. Um, I don't want to go into too many technical details about what that is. You can feel free to Google it if you want. But not only did we lose the baby, I also had to have emergency surgery. So I'm very grateful to uh, all the doctors and the nurses who got me through that. And it does mean that this has all been on my mind <laughs> for the better part of six months or so. Um, <clears throat> and when I got home from the surgery, I was really not in the mood to knit on anything very complicated. And luckily I had a baby blanket that I was knitting for my cousin's daughter. That was essentially this blanket. It was a strand of sort of 10 ply cotton held double with a strand of slubby cotton. And I cast it on just sort of on a whim. Uh, and then I put it down for a while. And when I got home after my surgery, it seemed like having something that was just going round and round in circles in stockinette would be quite therapeutic. And it was. Um, because this is just a center out blanket. So it starts in the middle here, and then you increase along these lines. So you can see the increased lines that are going off towards the corners. Uh, and essentially you just knit round and round in stockinette and you just have to remember to increase uh, at the markers. So you pop some markers in, that tells you where the increase. So it was just really therapeutic, I found, because I didn't have to think, and it was just something I could do with my hands, and I could still feel productive, and yeah, it just sort of helped me get through what was a bit of a tough period. So, I had been admiring Chloe's yarn from Wool & Works for a while, and I realized that she, she also had some slub yarn, and it was in these beautiful rainbow colors, and given my history with the blanket and the fact that in the pregnancy loss community there's this concept of what's called a rainbow baby which is basically a baby who was born after a loss um and so it just seemed like a really good idea to publish the pattern as a rainbow baby i'm calling it the rainbow baby baby blanket <laughs> uh yeah so uh, yeah, sorry. Don't know how eloquent I can be about all of this, actually. 
keep thinking that I'm okay talking about it, and I am in general, but it's still a little bit tough sometimes. So I feel like, what else do I want to tell you about this? Um, so part of why I talk about this stuff, which is not stuff that people talk about a lot, is that it turns out that uh, miscarriages are really, really common. So the current estimates that I've seen are somewhere between one in four and one in five pregnancies end in a miscarriage. And this is not something that anyone tells you until you have one yourself, because all of a sudden, as soon as you mention it to anybody, everyone has some sort of story about either themselves or a loved one who has gone through that. So it's very, very common, and I wish people would talk about it more, just because the first time you have one, you, you just don't know about any of these things, and then you just feel really alone until everyone starts telling you that they have also had experiences with it. So I just think we should talk about it more. Um, the other thing too is that it turns out that there are some a lot of communities and foundations and things that are involved in helping people through things like this. So if you're in Australia, I feel like a lot of people know about the Red Nose Foundation because of Red Nose Day. And I always thought that was about just child safety and infant protection and stuff. But it turns out that they also have a partner company called SANS. I don't remember off the top of my head what it stands for. But together, the Red Nose Foundation and SANS also do a lot of work around supporting families through sort of pregnancy loss and infant loss. And the 15th of October is International Pregnancy Loss Awareness Day. So all that being said, I figured that I'd donate a bunch of the proceeds from sales of the baby blanket to SANS and the Red Nose Foundation. So the blanket is coming out on the 15th of October, maybe the 14th, I haven't entirely decided yet. Probably on the 14th of October, because I normally release on Fridays. And so that is to mark Pregnancy Loss Awareness Day. And yeah, I think I'll be donating about 25% of all the proceeds to SANS and the Red Nose Foundation. So if you would like to help me support them, then I would really appreciate it if you grabbed yourself a copy. So the easiest way of doing that is hopping on my mailing list because I will definitely send out an email to tell everyone when it's ready. Uh, otherwise, I will just remind you all again next podcast episode. And also, yeah, I just, what was it that I was going to say? Oh, yes, it's a great self-care blanket, actually. So even if you're not going through anything to do with women's issues or fertility issues or anything like that, just in general, I thought it would be a great thing to release for people who just need a bit of a boost and a pick-me-up. I think that the idea of having something easy and happy to knit is just a great sort of like thing to have in your back pocket for times when you're just down in general regardless of what the reason is. So I've been calling it my self-care blanket behind the scenes and I hope that maybe it'll help you get through something too. So if you are interested in knitting this as well, I should mention that Chloe from Woolen Works is going to be restocking some of the slub yarn. So definitely get on that because the colors are gorgeous and the actual yarn is really fun. It's really nice to just hold double with something plain. So you don't even have to use the BWM cotton, just feel free to use anything sort of plainish that's in your stash, that's in about eight ply. And I have the directions for all the dimensions and how to do it and what size needles I recommend and stuff in the pattern. Oh, and one last thing that I wanted to say for Off the Needles is uh, a quick follow-up from last month. I think I gave you all the impression that I hate all my knitting needles. <laughs> I watched it back and I did really rant about how much I disliked various things for a long time. And I sort of didn't emphasize how much I do like my current set. <laughs> so I do very much like the Swiv 360 cables from Chiago. Chi Chiago? Oh gosh, don't know how to pronounce that today. Um, and they're working very well with my bamboo spin tips. So that combo is working really well for me and I do quite like it. Okay, that's off the needles. And the next section I have is knitting clinic. I do actually have a question this month, which was quite exciting. So, 
The question's from Jancy, and she asked, now that we're moving into warmer weather, which we are in the Southern Hemisphere, can we substitute cotton yarn for wool yarn in patterns? So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> I feel like that is the answer for all substitu substitution questions. The answer is always basically, yes, you can, but here are some things you need to watch out for. So one of the things you can do that will most effectively help you level up your knitting is learning about the different properties of different fibers. So cotton and wool are quite different in a lot of different ways. So the first thing you want to do is find a yarn that is in the same weight. So if it's 10 ply pattern, you need a in wool, you need a 10 ply pattern in cotton, etc. Um, and I have a long tutorial video about yarn weights uh, up here in the top left if you need that help. And then the next thing you need to do is have a think about what you're making. So here are the things that are different between cotton and wool. Wool is a lot lighter. So essentially for the same yardage or meterage of wool, the weight of the cotton, so not the yarn weight, like not the ply, but the actual, literally how heavy it is, is higher in cotton. So that means that the same piece, because it uses the same number of meters of each, it will be literally heavier in the cotton than it is in the wool. So the other thing about cotton and wool is that cotton is less stretchy than wool. So not just in the terms of like, if you pull on cotton, it stretches less, but also it's less elastic. So if you take a bit of wool and you either wet it or you stretch it, when it dries and when it springs back, it actually does sort of go back into its original shape, which is why when you block merino, it looks really sad and stretched out, but then when it dries, it shrinks back into about where you wanted it to be. Cotton, on the other hand, doesn't have that memory. So as it stretches out, it doesn't spring back, it just stays stretched. So if you put both the weight and the lack of stretchiness together, what that means for cotton garments is that because they're heavy, they sink down more, and because they don't stretch back, they stay stretched out, which means the cotton over time grows, essentially. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is just something that you have to watch out for. Because if you don't manage it correctly, all of your garments will stretch out. So cotton's great for things like blankets, shawls, things where the sizing isn't very particular. If it is something where the sizing matters, like obviously a cardigan or a jumper or a shirt, there are a couple of things you wanna watch out for. So first off, you want it to be light. Try and find a pattern that uses less yarn. So things that are really good for that are tank tops, or lighter weight garments that don't eat your yarn up. So there is particular stitch patterns that I can think of, like cables, for example. Cables use a lot of yarn, like a lot of yarn. If you've ever knit cables, you'll have noticed that you need to buy a lot more balls for a cable jumper than you do for a plain jumper. So maybe avoid the cables. Uh, but things like stockinette are usually fine, and lace as well is usually fine in cotton because it's a lot lighter and it uses less yarn. So the final piece isn't as heavy and it won't stretch itself out. Also, if you can do it in a lighter weight yarn, as in say a four ply or a fingering rather than a 10 ply or a worsted, then that is also a lot lighter. So it'll keep its shape a little bit more easily. So for example, I have a four ply dress that I made in cotton that has lasted me a decade. It's been totally fine. I don't think it's stretched out much. I mean, it's a dress, so it's meant to be a bit longer. So maybe it's stretched out lengthways and I just haven't noticed. But yeah, literally I've had it for 10 years and it's totally fine still. So try and find things that are lighter weight, a little bit less material, definitely less dense in terms of the stitches. And also, if it's a pattern that is seamed, don't convert it to being in the round. So the thing with seams is that they help things keep their structure. And they also help things keep their like length essentially, and they provide support 
for the knitted pieces and they carry some of the weight. So if something is seamless, all of the weight is just dragging down. But when there are seams involved, some of that weight is transferred to the seam because the seam itself is very, very inelastic. So it carries some of the weight for you. So all that being said is that seamed garments won't stretch out quite as much vertically. So I would actually recommend trying to find a seamed piece in the first place if you want to knit with cotton in a garment. And also don't convert something from a seamed pattern into a pattern in the round if you are knitting it in cotton. If you hate seaming, that's totally fine. I used to hate seaming as well. There is a link up here for the method I use to seam now, which has made me stop hating seaming. <laughs> I essentially use a crochet hook and the pattern, I'm sorry, the tutorial is for complete beginners to crochet. So if you've never used a hook before, don't worry, just give it a watch. It's actually pretty straightforward. So yeah, those are all the tips that I have for converting stuff into cotton. If you are interested in more tips about converting or substituting different yarn types and fibers, let me know because I have had an idea for a video on that topic for a really long time. And if enough of you would like it, then I'll probably get into gear and actually make it. Okay, the final section is up next, which is where I talk about what is going on next month. So there's not a whole lot to tell you actually. I do want to tell you what I'm planning on casting on next. So I did a long video last maybe two or three months ago actually about what my winter knitting queue looked like and I really didn't get through much of it. <laughs> so I'm slowly making my way through that and I decided that the next thing I'm going to make from that queue is Ayami by Isabel Kramer which is a 10 ply cabled circular yoke jumper. Uh, it is still cold enough that I want a cable jumper, so I'm going to give that a shot. Um, I'm actually going to knit it in 8-ply, so it's going to be a little bit drapier and a little more open, I think. So I need to do a gauge swatch and just check what size and gauge I want to make, because I may make a slightly bigger size in a smaller gauge. But I'll give you all the details next month after I cast on it. So this is Glen Haven Knits, who is a local dyer and this is their Merry Silk DK which is 75% merino and 25% silk so I'm excited to work with some silk again. So hopefully I'll have that on the needles next month and other than that yeah the baby blanket's coming out on October 15th or 14th I don't know we'll see <laughs> keep an eye out on my Instagram. If you're new here thank you very much for joining me you can subscribe to the channel clicking this button here and there is a playlist for all of the previous episodes of the podcast right here. And other than that, I'm Katrina Walser from All Fun Cat, and I'll see you next month. Happy knitting!